Welcome, Welcome to, to Shenanigans Ensue with Mary San Giovanni! Welcome to Cosmic Shenanigans. I'm Mary San Giovanni, and of course I am up to shenanigans once again of Cosmic Proportions. Today, we're going to talk about The Women of the Wood, written by New Jersey-born A. Merritt, that would be Abraham Merritt, and first published in that shining beacon of weird and cosmic horror short fiction, Weird Tales, in August of 1926. Interestingly enough, as I was doing research for this, as a lead story for that issue, Weird Tales misprinted the title as The Woman of the Wood on the cover of the magazine. So I thought that was kind of interesting because it, it, uh, it took some further research to make sure that I, I hadn't, you know, gotten the name wrong all this time. But it is actually The Women of the Wood. Now this story is, it's, it's the kind of thing that really hits a sort of sweet spot for me. I wish I'd read it before Savage Woods, although... Having written Savage Woods, it's kind of neat to see that uh, Merritt and I were, were tapping from the same uh, zeitgeist, I guess, about woods-related horror. Um, this story, much like, I guess, Savage Woods, this story is built upon the personification of nature. Now, cosmic horror, as we've discussed in the past, often attributes supernatural or paranormal power to natural things. This happens quite often. And whether that power is good or evil, uh, it's used as a means of setting, describing the setting or, you know, setting an atmosphere. Uh, and it also frequently uses the setting as another character to emphasize the strange in the world all around us and in secret hidden worlds with magic and different physical laws which are beneath, above, or all around the world that we know. These personified natural elements are attributed intent, and sometimes that is good or evil, although most frequently, as we've discussed in the past, indifferent and often savage in its indifference. In this story, we have dryads or elementals. I, I'm leaning more probably toward dryads because they're specifically tree spirits, essentially, and they're fighting for survival against generations of a family bitter at having once had to go without in order to protect them. The description here, which weaves the fantastic into uh, the actual description of this wooded valley, it's like Clark Ashton Smith level beautiful. And, and I don't say that lightly. And while so much of the Dryad's world is left mysterious, which is also often a, a cosmic horror thing, it's one of the few stories of its type that gives true character, and I mean actual personality, to the supposed monsters, quote, monsters of the story. The whole story could be quoted as, as stunning examples of this, so I, I won't pick out just one, other than to quote the moment where the story starts to turn, in my opinion, toward cosmic horror. Nowhere was there sound. He let his oars drop and leaned forward, drifting. <coughs> Excuse me. In the silence, before him and around him, he felt opening the gateways of an unknown world. From that point on, we get the sense that his fancy about the trees being like maidens and their night lovers is more than that like the mists that so often uh, create these veils between different parts of the woods, there's a shift between reality as we know it and the supernatural world superimposed over it. The element of the veil being lifted is a cornerstone of cosmic horror, which is one of the reasons why I think that this, that this story does sort of, if not squarely fit into cosmic horror, it does sort of overlap. Though its scope is only suggested at, usually cosmic horror, there's, there's something of, of the uh, countless, of the innumerable, or of the so grand as to be almost beyond our ability to wrap our brains around it. We only get a suggestion of that in this, that our entire natural world 
is populated by, which, which we know is populated by countless trees and forests, coppices and glens, uh, that this may well be an army, a veritable legion of spirits more powerful, manipulative, and vindictive than we can imagine if they feel threatened. It's a little bit of a stretch to call that cosmic unless we assume that the superimposed world is one of an alternate dimension origin, which is not unlike the origin stories of fairies and gods of the woods according to ancient Celtic culture. The land of Tir Nanog, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, is the place in the sky said to be the home dimension of fairies and other elemental spirits as well as the Celtic pantheon of gods. It's the place that they came from in their great sky ships. The place on the other side of the veil where there is no time and there is no age or sickness. I guess you could say that it would seem like heaven except that the spirits of old were forces of nature. They were kind and cruel, beautiful and terrible, passionate about love and quick to anger. In essence, it was a world of nature personified, and I think that's an important theme that a lot of cosmic horror or weird fiction that borders cosmic horror comes back to over and over again. It's, if anything, maybe the fear of unstoppable forces. You know, unstoppable, you could say it's maybe a, a, a kind of fantastic, uh, a fantastic kind of uh, costume, I guess, to put on natural disasters, maybe. It's this sort of fear of, of natural forces, which are, are just bigger and beyond us, and indifferent to their effect on us. Now, what's interesting about personality? We mentioned that the monsters, for lack of a better way to say it, in this story, the supernatural beings in this story, um, they're given a sense of personality. And what's interesting about this particular story, despite it being what I would consider a cosmic horror, is how much of that personality is developed for the, for the kinds of characters that most cosmic horror chooses to relegate to the unknowable and unexplained. Not unlike the old tales of the fair folk and the people of the mounds, these spirits are evidently possessed of the ability to love and hate, to feel joy and fear and despair and sorrow and that they show true loyalty and true tenderness to each other and to people who respect them. If there's any true element of horror in this story at all, really, it may be said to be the unspoken trauma of war and how easy it is to bring PTSD-driven murderous rage to the surface, even years after healing is supposedly done. An idea which took another 40 plus years for human psychologists to truly understand. This was written in the 20s before they really understood the idea of PTSD post-war. Um, for a while I think they called it being shell-shocked, but I, that, that's really what this main character, this uh, ex-soldier McKay, is experiencing. He's experiencing trauma from having been on the front lines of the war. Now. I assume that readers are supposed to feel that there's something monstrous about these wood spirits, these tree spirits ability and their willingness to enchant a damaged war vet into killing for them. And to take it a step further, that there's something tragic about McKay's inability to feel remorse after killing, a sign that he may really be irrevocably broken. However, once again, I think what we're seeing here is more of a case of the savagery of nature, which is not inherently evil. The trees are willing to do whatever it takes to protect themselves and each other. And that's nature, harsh as it may sound. McKay, on the other hand, he's only defending the only thing that helped him heal or gave him peace after the war, and that were these trees. He really... that, that Merritt spends a, a good portion of the beginning of the story explaining how motherly, uh, how he felt uh, taken care of, almost like a child is taken care of by a mother in being surrounded by these trees, that any healing he'd done after the war was due to spending time in this particular valley and in the, in the company of these trees. And I think we could venture to say that the only monster clearly defined as such in the story 
is war itself. Whether that is the war that McKay, that McKay survived, albeit with trauma, or the war between the trees and the men who live across the lake, which is uh, this man, Polo, and his two sons, Pierre and... How awful is... Oh, and Jean. Pierre and Jean. We also have mention of the occult in this story, although it's so subtle that it might almost be missed. Um, McKay is trying to justify, I guess, why he may have been uh, inclined to uh, attribute a certain personification or fantastic element to the trees across the lake that he likes to watch. And he mentions what is essentially scrying. Uh, it's scrying in a lot of pagan religions is basically a, a method of seeing into the unknown. Uh, and as I said, he, it's mentioned briefly in this context as an explanation for his having invested so much of the human uh, personality and uh, intentions and motivations into what would otherwise be mere trees, so much so that it seemed real to him. And the quote was, McKay knew of those who, by watching the shifting clouds, could create and dwell for a time with wide open eyes within some similar land of fantasy, knew others who needed but to stare at smoothly falling water to set themselves within a world of waking dream. There were those who could summon dreams by gazing into a ball of crystal. Others found their phantoms in saucers of shining ebon ink. These are all ways that uh, the, the, the folk who, who subscribe to the old religions would have foretold the future. Uh, he's describing the trances and the actual physical means by which people did this. So there is a, a slight element of the occult, which again, if, if we're looking for things to tie this to, to cosmic horror, there is that. Um, and by extension of that, we could say that McKay maybe is possessed of this ability. When he's in the woods, because I guess maybe the, the tree people found something vulnerable in him, or something manipulatable, if that's even a word, but I'm a writer, I can make up words. Um, there is something about that in uh, the tree's interaction with McKay that uh, they let him see, they let him hear, they let him know that they're there as more than just trees. And so there's an element of magic in that. Uh, but again, I, I, I don't know that we can classify these beings despite their... Uh, despite their number, maybe, or their uh, their particular savagery when it comes to protecting themselves, I'm not so sure that these are necessarily monsters. And the reason, even in Merritt's opinion, and the reason I say that is because if we look at the ending of this story, we have an ending that's unusual for cosmic horror because it's a happy one. Most cosmic horror, you get to the end of it, and spoiler alert, uh, usually there's a descent into madness. Or there's this unknowable truth that, oh my God, there are things out there that we don't understand, and, they're, and any day now, they can break through. Bless you, kitty. That was a cat sneeze, in case that, that was picked up. Um, at any moment, they can break through this, this veil, this thin barrier between our world and, and their world, and come pouring through. Uh, there's usually an element, it usually ends on sort of a... a a note of unease or despair or, or, you know, true terror or horror, this story doesn't end that way. At, at first glance, it's almost Disneyan in its happily ever after approach. Uh, that is, unless we look at it a certain way, okay? Basically, we have McKay moving on to other things. His loose ends have been tied up. Given the job that he performed for the trees, he was worried about, you know, there being repercussions. The trees took care of that, okay? Um, his mind is clear. He doesn't feel guilt about essentially turning on his own kind to protect these trees. Um, he doesn't feel fear or remorse. And, and he, he drives off into the sunset, more or less. Um, the, the place where he was staying, they do ask him to leave because they don't know why, but they know that he is somehow involved 
with the beings in the woods, okay? There's also this this idea, too, that this is not un... This is almost common knowledge, it's just not spoken about, that there are these beings out there. And the owner of the inn where McKay is staying recognizes that McKay is, is somehow now part of that. And he sends him on his way. He doesn't wish him ill, but he, he sends him off. And we get the impression that, that McKay is okay with that. He's okay with going off into the world uh, after having had this experience. And yet, hanging over all of that is this sort of unspoken notion that it was the woods or the creatures in the woods that let him go, not the innkeeper. That as much as they would have liked him to stay, and as much as he kept denying that impulse, they let him go anyway. That they made it so he could move on that their paying a debt of gratitude for his sacrifice was tying up these loose ends for him. But we're not really sure McKay is okay. He, he comes across that way, but if you're reading underneath the words there, he committed murder. And that commission of murder may have undone all of his healing. Um, he may be now okay because he lost that last little bit of humanity that cared about killing, that cared about, that, that, that was traumatized in the first place. Uh, they mentioned that he developed scar tissue, that, that, the, that his trauma from the war had been an open wound, and over time the wound closed, and then the closing of the wound became scar tissue. What we're really seeing, I think, is now just scar tissue. Uh, and whether or not that makes him okay depends, I think, on, on your perspective about that. We don't know if he's crazy, but of course, because it's a cosmic horror story, there is an insanity angle. Throughout the whole story, he thinks that there may be a part of him that is either just sort of reeling from the trauma of war and hallucinating, or somehow, you know, is enchanted by, by the woods that he's somehow maybe a little bit off. He knows he's off. He knows that there, he may be a little crazy. And even though we know that he's not entirely crazy, at least so far as that he's not hallucinating the things that he's seeing, there is, there is an element at the end, I think, that suggests that he really did see what he, what he thinks he saw. Um, I think that, the, that an argument could be made that something is broken inside now. And it's because I think that that last little bit of humanity that last little bit that recognizes that as sentient beings, killing is, killing is wrong for the most part, um, that's gone now. I think he thinks the way the trees think. And regardless of, of whether or not he seems okay, that, that sort of unspoken notion suggests that he will always be in service to the trees, crazy or not, that wherever he ends up, the veil has been lifted now, and they will always have a hold over him. In essence, he's been drafted as a soldier again for a war against members of his own kind, and he doesn't even know it. And for many, that's a, that's a potential continuing horror. This idea that the one thing that he went to the trees to escape, they have drafted him to be again. And that he's good at it, that he lost something along the way. Um, again, I, I think that this story, although written around the same time as Lovecraft, I, we can't really say it's, it's, you know, pre or post Lovecraftian horror, but I do think it does sort of fit into that, that cosmic, it, it is definitely weird fiction, but I do think there are enough elements that allow us to, to classify this as a kind of cosmic horror. I think that what we're seeing here over the last 16 episodes is that cosmic horror seems to branch in two directions. It seems to branch totally toward the supernatural or to the supernatural elements of the natural. And I think that as Lovecraft's career went on, he went from the purely supernatural toward the supernatural aspects of the natural. So it's interesting to see that um, along the way, you know, pre-Lovecraft, post-Lovecraft, and during Lovecraft's time, that there are cosmic horror stories, things that I think can, can justifiably be considered cosmic horror, that take one of two approaches to cosmic horror. Uh, 
it's sort of a fascinating thing because I, you know, for me personally as a writer, I, I've been doing cosmic horror for so long. I thought Savage Woods, which is a story about tree spirits, was a deviation from cosmic horror. And having read this, I realized it really isn't. It really is just something from the other branch. Uh, see what I did there? The pun with the trees and the branches. Uh, yeah, uh, it's just another branch of cosmic horror. So that's basically all I have for this week. Um, I would, as always, like to thank Dave Thomas, who is awesomely engineering things in the background here. Um, if you want to show your appreciation for, for Dave Thomas and all of his awesomeness, um, you can check out his Meteor Notes channel on Twitch. That's twitch.tv slash Meteor Notes, where he will be playing... Remind me again what game you said it was? Path of Exile? Well, yeah. Path of Exile with Bert, the <laughs> ever-lovable kitty cat. Um, you can also check out the horror show with Brian Keane. Uh, you can hear me and Dave and Brian talking about everything related to horror. And you can also advertise on Cosmic Shenanigans if you would like to do that. I'll be honest. I don't know all of the ins and outs of the advertising situation. The best thing to do if you want to advertise with Cosmic Shenanigans is email Armand Rosamilia. If you go to the Project Entertainment Network website, I believe there's a button, I think it's in the upper right hand corner, that you can click on that will allow you to, uh, that will put you in communication with Armand as far as uh, discussing the, the terms about uh, advertising on Cosmic Shenanigans. I'm perfectly happy to have you, so by all means, you know, add away. You can check out past present, future, all or one in Cosmic Shenanigans. Uh, you can check out all these episodes for free, always for free, on Project Entertainment Network, Stitcher, now on Spotify, woo, Google Play, iTunes, and all other platforms. And if there's anything that you'd like me to discuss, any story or novel or music or video game or television show or anything else that you think would be suitable to discuss on Cosmic Shenanigans, I'm always looking for ideas. Please, you know, send me a message on the Facebook uh, or Twitter, or you can email me, and I will add it to my list. Okay? Thanks for listening. See you soon. Bye-bye. Every person's story has something to teach us. How others view life, how obstacles are overcome, how joy is felt, how fears are faced, how love is expressed. The Matters of Faith podcast explores individual stories of people's lives and how faith plays a part. It may not be your story, but it may help shape yours. The Matters of Faith podcast with Jay Wilburn is on Project Entertainment Network.